Hi again, everyone, and sorry about the technical difficulties, but um, we're getting started for real, I promise. Um, in just a minute, you're going to hear from Sarah Nelson of the Association of Flight Attendants and Stacey Davis-Gates of the Chicago Teachers Union. But first, we are going to share a quick video from our friends, all of those Amazon workers you've been hearing so much about lately. My name is Christian Samarron. I'm an Amazon delivery center worker in Chicago and a proud member of DCH1 Amazonians United. Amazon has been raking in billions of dollars during this pandemic while showing a complete disregard for our lives. Until we took action, Amazon wasn't providing masks, hand sanitizer or wipes, and they were working us faster than they are now to ship out all these non-essential goods. We weren't surprised though, because just a year ago, Amazon wasn't even giving us clean, regular access to water even though coworkers have been passing out from dehydration. This sparked our organizing and we forced Amazon to provide us with water after doing a petition and presenting it to the manager at the start of our shift. We decided after this success to keep organizing to get other issues fixed. We took over our manager's office during a break to communicate our demands and made them real nervous. We got managers retrained because they were treating us like we were children. We started doing potlucks during lunch and building community with our coworkers. We saw Amazonians United Sacramento wear buttons and walk out for PTO. And so we did a PTO petition and started wearing buttons too. That PTO movement grew from Sacramento to Chicago to New York City. And that resulted in winning PTO for tens of thousands of Amazon workers. We've learned that we make change by organizing ourselves. So when COVID-19 arrived at DCH1, we held an emergency call, drafted our demands, collected signatures, and organized four safety strikes, demanding Amazon shut down and clean up. A majority of coworkers on each of the shifts we struck joined us outside or did not go into work. So Amazon wasn't able to do very much. Everyone saw our managers nervous and scared, yelling threats at us from behind the police cars. Amazon did not shut down, but they did immediately improve safety protocols and reduce the speed of work. Amazon workers around the U.S. have been reaching out to us saying they're going through the exact same thing and they want to know how they can get organized too. Our movement is growing deep and is spreading wide. Amazon started trying to scare us with HR meetings and retaliatory write-ups, but we're defending ourselves by filing unfair labor practice charges and launching an international anti-retaliation campaign because when they hit us, we hit them harder. We need our fellow workers everywhere to start organizing and building power at your workplaces. We don't wait for someone to come save us. We gotta defend ourselves and our communities from our boss's greed. There's also many ways y'all can get plugged into this movement we're building. Go to our Facebook page, DCH1 Amazonians United, and in the About section, you'll see we have links for people to sign up to help or join our movement. Just know that we're building this up ourselves, independently and democratically, as Amazon workers. We welcome your genuine solidarity that respects how we're building our organization, and we look forward to building up an international labor movement together with you all. Hello again, and thank you. Um, to get our conversation started here, I'm going to ask each of our speakers to give us a quick five minutes on where they think we are right now and what should happen next. And then I have a few questions for them before we open it up to all of you. Um, so Stacy, do you want to go first? Sure. Um, thank you. Um, this is a, a great opportunity to talk through um, the moment we're in right now. Um, shouts out to Labor Notes and Haymarket for putting this together. Um, and also shouts out for like this all female panel. Like it's, it's very important in this moment that we understand who the workers are and where, you know, the center of gravity has to um, be with female workers in this moment. We're frontline workers, we're heads of household, we're mothers. Um, and so that makes this pandemic and what's happening with frontline workers even more insidious because not only are frontline workers dying every day, they're leaving behind whole families. Um, and so we have to contextualize what this is. We have to put a face on it. We have to make sure that we are using the language um, that is not a generic worker, but that it, there are black workers in Detroit who have given, who have lost their lives. There are female workers across this country um, who have lost their lives and consequently their families are suffering as a result of it. Um, but we're here. Um, and so, you know, three things that I've been thinking about um, very much is that, you know, we often talk about 
you know, triggering a moment of revolution where um, the many um, are able to dictate and provide space, leadership and guidance um, in this country and abroad. Well, we didn't trigger this moment. You know, it, it's an insidious uh, virus that has triggered this moment. And yet we're here. Um, so we're teachers in Chicago. We're paraprofessionals. We're clerks, you know, and it is important for us to organize across sectors. Um, I'm wearing an SEIU T-shirt um, intentionally in this moment. Um, SEIU Healthcare, um, a very close ally of ours at the Chicago Teachers Union, um, their nursing home workers have sent notice to 40 nursing homes to say that they're going on strike. And they're not just going on strike for wages and benefits. They are going on strike because they need to live. They need to be available to their families. And then to make it even more personal, these women, these black women, these brown women, um, these working women, they're mothers, which means that they are the mothers of our students in the Chicago public schools. And that this um, across sector organizing, this across sector solidarity is the only thing that's going to save us in this moment. Look, I know that we, you know, we, we talk a lot about Trump and what he's not doing. Um, we're lifting up governors in this moment. Um, we're talking about local politicians in this moment. But let me be very clear about what this moment is and it isn't. They're not going to save us. <clears throat> we are going to save us. And so the moment that people have been opining about, reading books about, studying about, we're here. So we have got to take this moment and clarify the needs of the many. And the needs of the many are different from the needs of those who are on Wall Street. So when we say recovery, recovery is not a $1,200 check. Recovery is I have free health care. Recovery is that I have a union in every single workplace to make sure that I'm supported and I'm protected. Recovery means I don't lose my home to foreclosure. Recovery means that I don't get kicked out or evicted because I cannot meet my obligations because I'm unemployed. Recovery means that we are going to transform this in a multiracial, multi-ethnic coalition led by women to make sure that we are in a position to not just reimagine, I'm sick of imagining, but that we are implementing a society that prioritizes people, their humanity, and their safety. Um, we're here. We're here. We don't have to theorize about it anymore. We're here. Center brown people who are still um, in, in cages at the border. Center um, black men and women who have been put in cages across this country. Center the worker who was ringing you out at the grocery store, delivering packages to your home every day and your mail every day. Like we have to center this across sectors. We have to center this with women and we have to center this with brown and black leadership as well. Thank you. Thank you, Stacy. And I'm going to toss this to Sarah now. <laughs> Thanks, Sarah. <laughs> And thanks, Stacy. I mean, I, I don't know that I can do that any better than my sister Stacy just did. Um, but what I am going to do is, since it's May Day, I'm going to start off with a quote from Mother Jones that always centers me. So she said, the capitalists say there is no need of labor organizing, but the fact that they themselves are continually organizing shows their real beliefs. The capitalists want the most labor for the least money, and the laborers want the most money for the least labor. Workers produce wealth and build the world's palaces, but they neither use the wealth nor dwell in those palaces. If you would only realize that you hold the solution of the whole problem in your own hands, you could settle the whole question easily. If, for instance, instead of striking in small groups, every industry in America were to hold up, the capitalists would be obliged to yield to any and all demands for the world could simply not go on. So let me let me just tell you, you know, this this is what we were talking about last year during the government shutdown. And let me just say that during the government shutdown, when federal workers were going to work, even though they weren't getting a paycheck, a lot of people said they should solve it. They should end this government shutdown by walking out. Well, that's exactly what the White House wanted them to do. And so we are smarter. 
You know, I've been in a lot of boardrooms. They do not have the corner market on smarts. Okay, we are smarter than that. That is exactly what the president wanted them to do. He wanted them. He wanted them to hand to them the ability to privatize all of government functions. And they didn't do that. They didn't do that. Those workers came to work and made good on the oath that they made to this country and all of us and continued to work for all of us. And you know what? When they came to work, American people across the country, even though they were told we were in this deep divide, were coming into the airports and saying to TSA workers, thank you. In places where they usually are not saying thank you, by the way, and are usually not very nice. They were saying thank you. And what can I do to help you? And how can I help? And that was the common experience everywhere. You ordinary people were ready to take care of each other in extraordinary circumstances. And so it was only a few people who wanted to take all the money and all the control and all the power and were not afraid to put the rest of us in chaos, to put the rest of our lives on the line in order to do that. And so... We had to say, we can't have the people who are being shut out of work, we can't have the people who are being harmed take all the risk upon themselves. They're already put in an impossible situation. But if they can't do their job, we can't do our job either. And that principle goes forward no matter what we're talking about. So when we think about work today and we think about International Workers Day, we have to think about the fact that work has no borders. That's right. There is no difference. There is no difference between gender. There is no difference between what we believe in. There is no difference between who we love. There is the fact that we work and we create all the value in this world. And if we stand together and we don't allow them to divide us by hate, then we have all the power to take what's ours. So that's what we have to understand in this moment is that Mother Jones told us that the capitalists are always organizing and the capitalists are trying to use this moment right now. Mitch McConnell just said, just put, laid down the demands for the capitalists. He said in this next package, it has to be required that there are liability protections for the businesses. No protections for the workers, but liability protections for the businesses. They're literally trading lives for money. They're literally ordering people to go to their slaughter in the meatpacking factories. And they're literally at telling people they're gonna open up businesses and come back to work so that they can deny people unemployment benefits, so that they can deny people health care. So we have to make our demands clear and we have to understand what's at stake and we have to be clear about that. And so we have to be clear about the fact that Mitch McConnell is a shill for the billionaires. And it doesn't matter what Trump is saying at the podium. It doesn't matter because Mitch McConnell answers to his caucus who answers to you. And so right now in this moment, I was just thinking about that power analysis, and it's very difficult to talk about a general strike right now. It's very di difficult to talk about a general strike. Let's be real. When a lot of people are out of work and a general strike will simply mean that we are handing over to the government the argument not to give people unemployment benefits, not to give people help right now in this time of need. And so and and also to say to our healthcare workers who are out there slugging it out on the front lines without the proper PPE, without the backing from their country, that, that we're putting that on them too to ask that question. Because that is what the other side will say. That is how they will talk about us. They will talk about us as uncaring people. So we have to think strategically about where our power comes from. And right now, our power, right now, our power in this moment is this election coming up. Now, they are not gonna come and save us. Like Stacy said, they are not gonna come and save us. But if they think that we're not gonna save them, they just might do something about it. And so we have to make sure that we are backing, number one, where people are taking on these safety strikes, we need to spread the word about what's at stake. We need to spread the word about who is putting those lives on the line and what is happening there. And we need to spread that word amongst each other and make it very clear. If we can define what's at stake, then people are able to define what they're willing to do about it. And we have to make very clear to the Democrats that if Mitch McConnell is going to say that what his demand is that, that there are no liability for the businesses if people die or get hurt on the job during this time, then our demand is treble damages. It's the standoff. Our demand is clear. You're trading lives for money. So our demand 
is higher than your demand. Hmm. And then we might just get some worker protections and real protections in healthcare for all and a green infrastructure that we can support with good green jobs and all the things that we need, like the right to strike when we don't agree with the conditions at work, like the right to organize and not have to go through ridiculous elections that take forever, like the right to actually negotiate with the people who truly control your work. So that's what we need to be thinking about in this moment, because the capitalists see this as their moment of opportunity to take all the money and all the power. And the truth is that they are creating chaos, but we need to take the power back and say that the chaos is ours. We're going to own the chaos. And we're going to make the chaos a hell of a lot worse for you because the minute that they think that the risk is too great for them, that is when change is made in our favor. So make our demands clear and make clear what we're going to do about it. And we're going to make real change in this moment. I want an own the chaos t-shirt. <laughs> <laughs> That's amazing. Um, so what both of you were just saying there made me think about the way that we are talking suddenly about essential workers, right? I drive through Philadelphia to go to the grocery store and there's big billboards in my city saying thank you to grocery store workers. Um, so we have this brief moment of thanking workers and calling them heroes, but how does that help us build power in this moment? And because this is gonna get confusing, I'm gonna go to Stacy first again. Uh, thanks, Sarah. Um... How do we build power in this moment? Um, for us in Chicago, it's always been about the discussion with the workers. It's always been about what is the very thing that we need to um, focus on in this moment. So look, we've been here before. In 2008, there was uh, the Great Recession. And what the Great Recession um, resulted in massive foreclosures, um, folks out of work. Um, but on the flip side, it was also a time where the greatest concentration of power and wealth um, happened. You know, I, I say it all the time in Chicago, we have Cottage Grove on the south side. On the west side, you know, we have Holman Avenue. Those places never recovered from 2008. However, Wall Street is, and quite frankly, the stock market is doing just fine. Mm -hmm. So things are happening right now for some just fine. So what we have to do in this moment is identify the fact that the people, the many, they need it. The second thing that we need to do is identify who is unorganized and who we haven't invited to our party. Um, you know, labor for so long has been a caricature of white men with hard hats and not um, the nurses that are in hospitals saving lives right now or the CNAs in hospitals saving life right now or or the laundry workers or or environmental services cleaning up the rooms um, to make it safe for everyone. So if, if we have to do one thing in this moment, it's not just thank a worker, it's to identify who the workers are who have our backs right now. And those are the very people who have our backs right now. They are making it work. And so not just say thank you, but within the labor movement, we have to prioritize who gets to talk and not just be a shill or not just be a mascot, but who gets to make strategic decisions, who gets to lead. Who gets to invite other people into the tent and make it more diverse and make it bigger? For so long, we've missed the opportunity to advocate effectively for our immigrant communities. And immigrants are not just coming from south, uh, south of the border. They're also coming from Africa. They're also coming from the Caribbean. They're also the people who are taking care of the kids of the 1% right now and risking their lives to even do mm -hmm. that. Like, so we, we really have to be clear in the labor movement right now of where we center this. And if we are not centering it with, with the train operators and the bus drivers, then we're missing a moment. Look, the best thing our members, our educators can do right now is make a call home and ask parents how they're doing. Ask families, what can we do with them and for them? And then ask them to sign on to a pledge that all of us get to recover, not just Wall Street. And then ultimately, we're going to have to be in a position to shut all of this down. So we know that it can get shut down because we're on uh, Skype right now as a result of the shutdown. <laughs> like we're, we're not like we're, we're not in a theater somewhere having this discussion with people all around us. 
we have to make a decision, not the virus. We have to make a decision, not Wall Street. We have to make a decision, not the wealthy landowners who have been making decisions for a long time. We also have to make a decision to trust each other, too. We have to make a decision to trust those who are doing the work, to hear them and to create policy and strategy that reflects their needs. That's That's excellent, Sarah. Well, I mean, that's exactly right. You got to listen to the workers and focus it around them. And um, this 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 is the moment to talk about the value of work and and who those workers are and what exactly they're doing and how this world just doesn't go on unless every single one of them does that work. Um, You know, I think about the sanitation workers that Dr. King was striking with and talking about the fact that if they couldn't do their work, then the rest of us were going to get sick. Mm -hmm. And isn't that the truth? Isn't that the truth right now? And so, you know, you're right, Stacey, this is, this is a moment when we need to be uh, making those relationships, calling out those, those commonalities. And one thing that we have going for us that's really to our benefit right now is that we are having a shared experience here. That's right. Mm-hmm. And that is what happens on the strike line, too. You know, a lot mm-hmm. of times when you're in the workplace, you don't choose who you're in the workplace with. You're, the boss hires everybody in that workplace, right? Mm-hmm. And so, as, as Stacy knows, when you got a plan for a strike, uh, it's it's not as simple as uh, who you're going to vote for in, in November. No, 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 no. <laughs> this is not going to be something that's going to be won with 51% margin. This is something where everyone understands that we have more in common with our common demands than anything that could divide us. And it starts out with a lot of organizing and a lot of conversations about what's at stake and what are our demands and what are we willing to do. And then by the time you get out on that strike line, there's people talking to each other who maybe had never had those conversations with each other in the workplace, but all of a sudden they have a common bond and a common experience. And we're all going through that common experience right now, and we're all having different forms of heartache, and we're all having to deal with the challenges of this virus. And that gives us something common to build those relationships around so that when we get to a place that Stacy's talking about, because we're going to be in that place, this is our time to organize for that general strike. That's right. Because this is our moment, and there is going to be that moment where we are going to exercise that power together. And so every day, we can't let one day pass that we don't build those relationships, build those common experiences, build each other up, talk about the work that each other is doing, thank each other, okay? Not just thank a worker, but actually talk about their stories and ask them their stories and ask them to tell their stories. And, and thank God for, for Labor Notes and Haymarket Books and Sarah Jaffe for that on that point, by the way. Uh, we need more of that. Um, but... But but this is this is our moment to do that and plan for that day when we exercise that power. And that is coming very, very soon. So now is the time to use the shared experience to build uh, build that power. Amazing. So this time I knew it was going to go super fast. I have a million questions to ask. But um, <laughs> so for Stacy, I have um, today being May Day, May 1st is also the day that the rent is due for a lot of people. Okay. And there is organizing around the country going on for a rent strike. Um, in the last CTU strike, you guys made history basically by including demands around housing in your bargaining. Um, can you share some lessons from that fight and how labor can include more demands like that in the future? Absolutely. Um, We call it common good bargaining. Um, And I also say that common good bargaining is very easy for teachers to do because we are um, we're operators of common good. Like we are we are a part of the public sector that is offering a public good. Um, That being said, um, I, I was there was a question posed to me a couple of weeks ago with how will schools recovered post COVID? And I go, well, Um, that's a question, but let me ask you a better question. How are societies, how are the communities that envelop our school communities, how are they going to recover? Because if mom and dad are both unemployed, if the families are now homeless because they've been evicted, because there was no grace from a landlord, or because there was no legislative action from a mayor or a governor, then we're going to be in trouble. Because if you're not in a stable household, then, you know, taking a test, handing in homework, 
even sitting attention at attention in class is secondary, right? So this whole concept of the connectedness of housing, the connectedness of transportation, the connectedness of employment and health, those all impact our school communities. So we have to, as workers in school communities, we have to be very clear about what we're asking for. Listen, I can get a better wage and a benefit. I can. We, we can argue about that. We can even go on strike for that. But as a worker, when I go back into my classroom and I'm dealing with a classroom that is disproportionately disenfranchised because families don't have jobs and they're homeless, then anything that I could want to talk about makes very little sense because people are dealing with trauma. And we often forget that our children are experiencing COVID just like we're experiencing COVID. They may not have the language for it. They may not have um, the ability to connect with grownups to like express that. And they are still um, having a traumatic moment. That impact we won't know for years. But that being said, our school communities are going to have to see the reality of our responsibility and our accountability. My accountability as an educator is not to bring home a test score. My accountability as an educator is to fight for the resources that my students need in order to be a whole person. And to be a whole person, um, getting an education is a part of that. Excellent, excellent. For Sarah, you are in an industry that is both in the center of this current crisis and also the looming climate crisis, no pressure. Um, but so we're in this moment where we are seeing massive changes to every facet of our lives right now. Um, how do you think about this sort of going forward? You're a supporter of the Green New Deal. How do we think about this moment leading us towards a just transition? And how do you balance the tension between fighting for members right now and fighting for the future of the working class in a warming planet? Again, no pressure. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Um, so, you know, here's the thing. Flight attendants are experiencing the climate crisis every day when we go to work. Uh, we're experiencing it by bouncing around the cabin with 300 pound cars because there's more turbulence. We're experiencing it when planes don't, don't take off and they're grounded uh, because of the climate event or because the airport infrastructure was destroyed in that climate event and you can't fly there for a while. Uh, that's our work. Um, and then science predicts that at a certain point, those tarmacs get too hot and planes won't even be able to take off. Mm -hmm. um, so, and, and, and we also see, frankly, that our industry recognizes it too, because they're trying to save costs in, the, in mm -hmm. this time by going to biofuels. They're trying to compete for consumers based on talking about the, the greenest air travel, right? So there's a recognition across, they're not doing enough, but there's a recognition across the board uh, that this is coming and that the solutions to climate change are not the job killer. Climate change is the job killer itself. So as long as we can agree on what the problem is, which is the first step that we have to take, frankly, that, that's where we're still stuck right now, that we don't have agreement on what the problem is. We don't have agreement on the fact that, the, that climate change is, is the job killer. And we also, what I have found during this, you know, we put forward a people's bailout in this moment in time in the aviation industry that would keep people in their jobs, money from the federal government for the first time ever in a corporate bailout that tells the corporation exactly how to spend the money. And in fact, actually that that money has to go all of it to the workers and that they can't involuntarily furlough anyone, put anybody out of work. Oh, and that they can't have any stock buybacks and that they've got to have uh, caps on their executive compensation. People could not even imagine that that was possible. And so we had even progressives working against us saying, don't bail out the airlines because people are about tearing down one, because they're so damn angry. OK, so I don't blame them, but because of what's been going on. But two, because we can't even imagine a world where we can actually make it work for the workers. Oh. So, so this is a moment, we just showed it, you can. If you set clear demands and you say, we're gonna focus in on jobs and we're not going to allow them to divide environmentalists from the labor movement, but find our common ground, 
these conversations are going to have to happen in the union halls. They're not going to happen in self-selecting organizations where everybody thinks the same way. We're going to have to understand there's going to have to be hard conversations and you got to start with what the problem is, have everybody agree on that so that we can talk about the solutions. And if we don't if we don't host those conversations, then we are just handing this over to the capitalists to uh, to um, make money off of this crisis and then to create a crisis even bigger than we have ever imagined and then put us in even more hurt because they will have all the control. And so we need to start defining the problem and setting our set of demands because this is our moment in time and we see it right now. And th if there's a silver lining in this, in this uh, coronavirus, we're seeing exactly what happens when we stop burning and, and creating emissions into our environment. When we stop the airplanes from flying that are currently contributing to the climate crisis. We're seeing what happens when we actually take action. Now we got to think about how we build that new world with jobs, good union jobs, and not just maybe people can organize, but these are union jobs that has to be the baseline. That's where we start. All right, one more question for the both of you before we open it up to audience questions. Um, many of the strikes and actions that we've seen since the beginning of the coronavirus um, have been by non-union workers. So how do unions in this moment support this newfound militancy and in some ways kind of catch up with it? <laughs> Stacey, you look like you have something to say. <laughs> well, I mean, here's the thing. When I see this newfound militancy, I see my cousins. Right. Mm -hmm. I, I see people who look like me, people I grew up with, people who live in my neighborhood. And I'm happy about that. This is my point about um, how we have to reimagine leadership um, within labor and how it is incumbent on labor who's been here before to organize across sectors. Like we have to not just show up to their actions. We have to ask them what else do we need to do to, you know, support your fight? How can we be um, supportive and instructive to how this is going to be? How can we be included on your strategy session and listen through and, 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 and either mentor or take direction or just be there in support? You know, I do not want to, um, I don't want to say that we even know what's best to be honest with you, because if you're going on strike in the middle of a pandemic, I'm going to say you might know what's best already. Right. <laughs> <laughs> Think about it. The, the tremendous amount of risk that's being taken. Um, the fact that they're low wage workers to begin with already check to check um, the, the danger in which they are working in these moments. Um, I think we have a lot to learn from them. We have to prioritize spaces where they get to come and, and help us reimagine the power that we say we have, but so often don't flex because we might offend someone. Sarah? I'm just going to say that this is how our labor movement started, right? Mm -hmm. We didn't start with fully formed unions. We started actually in the coal fields with 28 different languages being spoken and the boss assuming we weren't going to be able to talk with each other because... Uh, because we were different and we were from different areas and we couldn't even speak the same language. But guess what? When there's a mine explosion and families die, we understand the hurt on each other's fa faces. And we understand having to comfort our children and say that, you know, your dad's not coming home. So uh, we have to get back to basics and understanding that the people who are going on strike who are not union members are already a part of this labor movement. That's right. Because every single worker belongs in this labor movement. There is not labor, there is not union members and non-union members. All workers belong in our labor movement. And that's how we have to start acting. And that's the best thing that the labor movement can start doing right now, is claiming these workers as already a part of our movement. They're not separate. They're a part of us. Excellent. So we're going to jump to audience questions in just a minute. Um, so get those in if you do not have them already. And in the meantime, while you're doing that, we're going to share another brief clip from some of our friends. This time, some of the frontline healthcare workers that you've probably been clapping for every week. Hi, uh, my name is Judy Sheridan Gonzalez. I'm a registered nurse at Montefiore Medical Center. 
the emergency room in the Bronx, New York, and I'm the president of the New York State Nurse Association representing 42,000 nurses in the state of New York, uh, reporting to you from the epicenter of the epicenter in the Bronx of this uh, COVID-19 crisis. If nothing else, this crisis, this inept response to the crisis has proven that our for-profit healthcare system is totally incapable of managing any kinds of disasters uh, based on its for-profit uh, structure. It's clear that it's not profitable for these structures to prepare for any kind of disaster, to save respirators and ventilators, equipment necessary to save lives, doesn't make money. Doesn't make money to have beds open and ready. Doesn't make money to have people prepared and ready to move on and handle such a situation. Uh, we need a national health care system. I do hope that people remember the suffering that they're going through right now as it eases up, as it ends, hopefully eventually they remember, not get amnesia about how the system has failed them. The system failed us in particular when the Centers for Disease Control decided to loosen their standards and gave the hospitals and the government an excuse to not provide us with the protective equipment that we need. I just left a virtual town hall where we commemorated the 25 nurses who died unnecessarily without protection because of treating COVID patients. This is inexcusable. In addition, there are many other workers, transit workers, uh, people who deliver your packages and your groceries, food workers, all of us who are supposedly essential but clearly are expendable to this society. If nothing else, it proves to us that we've got to change the system, not only the healthcare system, but the way we manage situations. Instead of opening up the economy, which is dangerous, which is going to just cause spread of the virus, we need to have government programs implemented, tax the rich, get a tax base that's much fairer so that we can actually take care of the people in our society that need us the most. In the community in which I live and work, we, have the, we are the last county with the worst health indices in the state. And of course, those are the people who suffer the most. We have the highest per capita uh, of COVID positive and deaths and the staff that cares for the patients in our community. We're the collateral damage to the way that the patients are treated in our community, the most vulnerable, uh, the most uh, needy. So we're hoping that at the very least, everybody takes a really hard look and realizes it's the people who are going to be able to change things. It's the people who must change things for the better, to make the world a better place. Hello again. And so I have some questions from some of you here. Um, I'm going to start with a question from Al Bradbury from Labor Notes. Um, what is the labor equivalent of disaster capitalism? Because we know that they're sitting around, as Sarah said earlier, planning for that. We know that they're going to be broke on purpose to try to break the unions. What is our version of that? You're not broke if you're taxing rich people. Like that's the bottom line. You are not broke if you are taxing rich people. And 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 and, and we do have to be clear about this moment. Like in 08, they came to um, educators across this country and they said, like, take a break on your retirement security. You know, make sure that you can teach 40 kids in a classroom. That mm -hmm. nurse or that social worker that you need, well, maybe not so much, right? And and they expected us to do more with less as inequality grew, mm -hmm. right? as wealth was concentrated at the very, very top. And many of our families did not have jobs. And we too were struggling to make ends meet in our own households, right? Getting rid of veteran teachers at the same time. So we know that script, right? And they're gonna take full advantage of it now. They're going to come with all of these austere policies from people who we are hero worshiping now because they are doing their jobs. Like, I, I don't believe, listen, I grew up in a household where you didn't get a cookie for doing your homework. That's what you were supposed to do, right? And so when we have elected leadership who are doing their jobs in this moment, I appreciate that because the guy in the White House is not doing his job. And that's a low bar. You don't get judged by that low bar. What we have to do very clearly in this moment is name disaster capitalism, name their chaos, and be very clear about calling out the normalization of that crazy stuff that's happening at state capitals right now with people trying to reopen before it's safe. Mm -hmm. They're not there by accident. 
the wealthy landowners in the South understood working class white people very well, and they sent them out in lynch mobs. So we've seen this video before. So we need to be clear about how a multiracial, a multiracial line that centers both racial justice, that centers female empowerment, is a part of naming austerity as racist, naming austerity as sexist, naming austerity as something that we are not going to do. That's number one. Number two, we have to be clear. Rich people get to put in, hey, I thank you for opening up the United Center, Jerry Ryan's door, and making sure that supplies can be there. We appreciate you. And you get to pay more taxes because you have it to pay in this moment. The woman in the nursing home that's risking her life every day, she doesn't have to survive with more cuts because she's a hero, remember? So we don't thank her with a billboard. We thank her because what wealthy people get to pay more. Wealthy corporations get to put more in the pot. Our social safety net doesn't exist. And when, and when we had a Great Depression, when, when the activism of the civil rights movement dovetailed, government got bigger. And government got bigger and black people and brown people and women benefited. And this is what we have to demand. So when we say a Green New Deal rhetorically, no, we're saying a Green New Deal in legislation and we're saying that rich people get to pay for it. Uh, All right. What Stacy said, and let me just say that, you know, um, that rich people don't get the privilege of handing out charity. Rich people have to pay taxes. Okay, so we are we this is not we are not going to set up a system where we are saying thank you and where we're begging for their help. No, I'm sorry. That was the feudal system of, of Elizabethan England. That we're not going back there. I mean, that's what that was. That's what they're trying to set up here. You know, when I when I hear that uh, I have a friend who works in a homeless shelter for women, okay, and she got a grant from Jeff Bezos to run this homeless shelter for women. Meanwhile, Jeff Bezos is playing paying his workers so poorly that they can't even afford to have a home. So this is, you know, no, no, no. We're not going to have a charity society. We're going to have a society where everybody pays their fair share and where workers can actually have a sustainable way of life. And so we take over the chaos. Yes, this is for you, sir, Jeffy. We we own the chaos. We own the chaos. And we own the chaos in this way. Stacey already talked about it. You know, Mother Jones said, I'm not a humanitarian. I'm a hellraiser. No matter the fight, don't be ladylike. God Almighty made women, and Rockefeller and his gang of thieves made the ladies. You know, they want us to conform to their conventions. But the white man's day is over, okay? Women are at the table. People of color are at the table. Gay people are at the table. We're all freaking at the table, okay? And we're going to take the table and own it. And that's really the difference here, is that we are going to make sure that we have leading voices from people who have been marginalized for years, who have been pitted against each other for years. I think about my own union, and I think about those women who formed this union in 1946. And the very first thing they did was negotiate a seniority list. You know why? So the boss couldn't have them trade sex for schedules. They Mm. put that out of work in 1946. And so when you actually bring people to the table who otherwise have been marginalized, they lead in a way that is thoughtful for everyone around them because they have had to make their way in life by looking and seeing everyone around them, as opposed to people who never have to think about anybody else because they're so damn privileged that all they see is themselves. Okay, so that is how we flip the script here. And that is how the labor movement is going to move forward, is that we are going to promote leaders who are going to lead without ego and who are going to be thinking about everyone around them because they've had to do it their whole lives. Excellent. So we have a question from Brett Wallace, which is how do we keep the momentum around Medicare for all um, beyond a single candidate, which is incredibly important right now, right? Because we are in a massive healthcare crisis and we're seeing how bad our healthcare system actually is. Look, this work has never been about a candidate. It's been about coalition. (laughs) It's been about community. It's been about labor. Um, You know, our formula is not one person. That's the whole point of union and solidarity. And so the the first thing is that we cannot get caught up 
in the morning of right now. Look, I know right now hurts. I know right now is disconcerting. And I also know that there are a group of people in our community that do not see today different from three months ago. And so what we have to do is be very clear about where we need to go it, with elections, with organizing. We talk about where we want to be. We don't talk about where we are right now. And we use the moment of right now to organize with our brothers and sisters across sectors. We use it to talk to our neighbors. Look, are we calling our neighbors even and saying, hey, yo, are you OK? What can I do for you? Where are our ties to mutual aid in this moment? Those are the building blocks of momentum. Those are the things that we get to do right now in order to shut it down later. Yeah, you know, what this virus has done is laid bare all of the problems in our society, all of our broken society. And where we already were building, we, we started by talking about this. This wasn't around a candidate. This was around coalition building and community building. And uh, for the first time, we actually have doctors in this debate when they were mm. pitted against, uh, against this debate before. Because people, people have a common experience here. Everybody has had someone who who died or couldn't get the care that they needed in this for-profit system. And that's the truth. And so we have to remember that this world is going to change when we demand it's going to change. And that's when we right. have that common experience, we can demand that together. And But we have to understand and believe that this is not something that you build in one election. This is what you build between the elections that matters. And, and that common experience has grown better than it ever has before. And this moment in time is showing us right now exactly what doesn't exist. But what needs to happen right now in order to get this virus under control is every single person has to have health care. So out of necessity, we have a moment in time where we can actually demand that what is part of these relief packages is care for everyone. Not coverage, okay? Because coverage, somebody else gets to decide what's covered and what isn't. Care for every single person. And that's what can be created here. This is what uh, Bernie Sanders has already introduced and is promoting. And we can demand it right now because this moment requires it. And we have to understand already that we have built the, uh, the political will behind this because the political will truly comes from the people. It doesn't come from the candidates. So we have this moment to show people what it can be if you actually have a healthcare system that provides care for every single person. We have that opportunity right now and we need to go for it. All right, so I am gonna, because we're getting close on time, I'm gonna combine some of these questions because I have a question about how we build racial solidarity in the labor organizing pro process. I have a question about how we convince coworkers to unionize if they are not, and then how we engage young people in the struggle. And I think those are all very related. So I'm just gonna put them all together for you. Go for it, Sarah. <laughs> uh, okay. Listen, um, we can't be afraid to ask people about their experience. And that's just the truth. And, and we can do that in our unions. We can, we can host that kind of conversation and we can say, you know what, if you're scared to ask the question because you don't know about somebody else, then that's exactly the time that you need to ask the question. And we just need to make that okay and create the space for that to happen. And I, I am not gonna go on and on about this because I could probably actually talk about this for a couple weeks. Um, but really that's, that, that's what it really comes down to is, is making it okay and actually very important um, to, ha to actually sit and ask somebody else and take the time to listen. Absolutely. Uh, you know, labor has got to grow up and be about the neighborhoods that our workers live in. Um, it's got to be about public safety and that I have to be able to go into a neighborhood when I punch out and feel safe in my neighborhood, not policed, but safe. You know, I have to go into a neighborhood that doesn't have vacancy and vacant lots. So that means that um, labor has to respond to the needs of the community. It has to speak to the needs, the total needs of the person. It's the 360 of our experience in this world. We cannot just say, hey, young kid, you don't understand yet. Keep living. When that little kid has probably lived more than we have based on their circumstance, right? Have overcome mm -hmm sacrificed, um, felt oppression in ways we would never know. 
We have to be clear about community and centering our movement in the 360 of the lives of the people who are on the uh, who are on the warehouse floor, who who are on the tray lines and in and, and the hospital, you know, who, who are in the locker rooms, you know, getting dressed to scrub into a surgery. Um, these are things that we need to be clear about. Even within, you know, our um, uh, u- bargaining unit, it can't just be the teacher. It has to be the school clerk. It has to be the teacher's assistant. It has to be the security guard. It has to be the cafeteria worker. We have to care about that community. Yeah. Yeah. And the student. When you say young people, I just forgot about that part. <laughs> but it's got to be about the student and the lives that they bring in there. They're not just, you know, a test or a test score. They are people who come with histories and experiences. Yeah. Yeah. So I'm going to ask you for closing thoughts um, and you can wrap this last question into those if you want to, um, which was just how do people support the essential worker strikes that are happening now? Um, And then also anything else that either of you wanted to mention that didn't get mentioned already? Sarah? Listen, yeah, um, people are craving solidarity. People crave solidarity right now. And I, I just, I have to liken this to the CTU strike. I mean, the demands that CTU put on this table was taking a risk. It's a risk to say, we're going to strike for something that maybe isn't directly about your paycheck or directly, directly connected to your job, even though you can make those connections, right? And so it's a risk to take, to have those conversations, But we have to take those risks because the only way we're going to change this world is if we're actually making people have to think about that, making people have to think about why it makes a difference for a teacher teaching in a classroom where their kids are coming to school and they didn't have a place to sleep the night before. Mm. Make them think about the fact that there's uh, parents at home working two and three jobs trying to get by and don't have time to take their child or the ability to take their child to a doctor to understand why they're having a hard time in school when all it took was a school nurse to find out, oh, this person has a hearing disability. Let's get them some hearing aids so they can actually hear in the class and be a student. Can you imagine what that's like for those parents to be able to provide that for their kid when they didn't know what the problem was and they didn't have the ability to even take the time to know or have the expertise or be able to access those those resources ctu had those conversations with their members and those conversations were not easy to have and those conversations were not immediately obvious to everyone but at the end when they had the conversations they had unity around why those demands were important to each one of those teachers jobs And not every single one of those teachers has a certain political identity that agrees with each other, but they had a common experience and they had a common understanding of what those demands were. So we have to have those same conversations about what these safety strikes are about and why it's connected to us and why we have to take part in supporting those workers. COVID has showed us that everything is connected. Everything is connected. And so um, our bargaining, our labor, um, it has to be about common good. Um, I'm going to be a broken record. It has to be about the 360 of a person's existence in this world in order for us to fight the power, in order for us to organize with each other. We have to see the humanity in one another. We have to break down the barriers and say, look, everyone deserves health care. Everyone deserves shelter. Everyone deserves a living wage. And I deserve to be safe when I go into my work site. Those are things that we can organize around regardless of region, geography, gender, race, or ethnicity. And so we just got to be clear about how we connect common good to humanity. And Sarah, we haven't talked about the post office, but I have to put this plug in. We have got to save our post office, okay? Nothing connects us more than our postal service. Nothing. Right. Nothing creates more equality than our postal service. Mm-hmm. It's older than our constitution. It employs 600,000 workers who are union workers with good union jobs. And it uh, and and what the president wants to do in increasing the the price 
for that postal service at this time to put that on the American public, we need to call that out. So we have really got to uh, stand up together and tell the stories about how the postal workers have helped each one of us in our mm -hmm. communities, including delivering 4 million prescriptions a day. That's right. Okay? Yeah. There are people who do not get the health care that they need if the postal service doesn't exist. There are airplanes that don't take off because they don't have enough revenue unless they have the mail and the billy of that airplane. Every single one of us is connected here. And our postal service, they are trying to privatize it and they are trying to divide our communities by getting rid of the postal service. And we all have to take this up as a priority and think about every single day, what am I gonna do every single day to talk about the postal service and the importance of the postal workers, what it means to me in my life and how I'm engaging 10 people about making it make a difference in their own lives and speaking up and demanding that this government bail out our postal service and make sure it stays in place. Yeah. yeah. Stacy, did you want to? Mic drop. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the postal service is in the constitution. Um, it provides among other things, an incredible subsidy for the press, which is my industry, so I'm biased, but yeah. Um, and it also could be a wonderful source of expansion, right? Postal banking, um, postal workers, they go to everyone's door. They know who lives in every neighborhood. Right. I was on a panel with a UK postal worker this summer who was just like, yeah, I know my customers. I know who's sick. I know who's having problems. I know all of those things because I go there every single day. Um, it's such a good point. It's such an important institution um, that I don't think there's a better way to... Oh, and also it is a huge employer of black and brown people because That's um, right. surprise, the private sector has always been more racist than the public sector. Um, so to wrap up, I don't even know how to top any of that because um, y'all are amazing. And this is what the labor movement looks like now, right? Like every single time somebody asks me a question about the labor movement, they're like, oh, well, men, and everybody's like the white working class. And I'm like, what do you think the working class looks like? Because it looks like this. Um, and that's who is going to solve the problems that we have right now. That's who's going to lead us out of this crisis. And um, yeah, so thank you to everybody who came here. Thank you to everyone who's donated. If you haven't yet and you are still making money yes. or want to do something with some of that stimulus check, you can donate to Labor Notes and Haymarket Books. There are links in the chat and it's labornotes.org and you can Venmo at Haymarket Books. Um, and we are going to go out with a few more workers this time, one of my favorite stories of this crisis, the GE workers who are demanding to make healthcare equipment rather than military equipment. Good afternoon, brothers and sisters. My name's Adam Kaczynski. I'm the president of IUE CWA Local 201 in Lynn, Massachusetts. We represent about 1,600 workers on the North Shore at Avis Budget, the Lynn Wastewater Treatment Plant, Saugus Public Library, Amatech Aerospace, and General Electric Aviation right here in Lynn. At GE, we've been involved in a fight for the 5S pandemic platform, in a fight for supplies, sanitation, six feet of social distancing, sick time, and serving the public, which is a demand that includes building life-saving ventilators in the GE union supply chain. Today on International Workers' Day, we stand in solidarity with all workers in our fight for safety on the job and justice in the workplace and our communities. We stand against corporate greed and those who will try to use this crisis to escalate the attack on working people. We need a people's bailout, a union-centered bailout, and a response that puts working families first, not profit margins. Solidarity from Local 201. Thank you all again for coming. Happy May Day. Go raise some hell.